Hello, welcome back to the Rhetoric Prof stream. Tonight we're going to be looking at this text, the New Rhetoric, a Treatise on Argumentation. Sorry that my uh, setup is a little bit off today because I got a new camera and I haven't done this in a while and um, uh, I opened this up as a you know, Adobe. So it's going to, I'm just kind of fiddling around here for a second. Bear with me if you happen to be here. I, I didn't, I'm not as prepared as I usually am which is usually not very. So now I'm very not prepared for this. But uh, yeah, I think it'll be good. I'm, we're, I'm teaching this in public speaking this summer. And uh, I've been in a reading group that's been going on for a while about this piece. And uh, it's a really important text in the history of rhetoric in the 20th century, especially in France, but also in America. Um, Chaim Perlman, who is one of the authors of this text, and had a long and storied career, uh, was kind of feted in the United States upon the reception of this in a way that apparently surprised him. And um, you probably don't hear about it too much today anywhere, but it's a, it's a very interesting text for thinking about some of the basic questions of rhetoric. And so it's called The New Rhetoric. It promises to be new. Uh, we'll see how new it is, I guess. We're just going to read the first part of this text. I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. I'm a little annoyed that it's not like... I should probably open it in Chrome because I know how to do that. So give me one more, one second to kind of try to salvage this already problematic thing. Uh, hold on a second. If I open it in a browser, somehow that'll like make the uh, window fitting of it better. A little bit better. In the meantime, listen to these lo-fi beats I got for you. Can you hear those? Um, <laughs> let's try it. Let's try it like this. Yeah, this might work a little bit better. My my old my good old trusty nonsense way of doing this that works for me. That is not the correct way to do it. <laughs> but it, it'll, it'll work for our purposes. Okay, now let me bring this forward a little bit. Oops, wrong one. Dude, that's not what I wanted to do. Wow, this is hilarious. <laughs> ah. Also, it's a beautiful day today. I went to the park. There were kites being flown everywhere by children. There's a nice breeze. I sat out on a lichenous rock, and um, you know, it's been kind of breezy today. And I got a kitchen fan on in here, so I'm kind of still trying to get that breeze going. So hopefully, hopefully this will also feel like a breeze. It won't. <laughs> it's not the breeziest text. You know, it's challenging in certain ways. But um, we're going to try to keep it breezy here. But I'm going to stop the music for the time being. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Let me stop the music. I actually don't even know if you can hear that anymore. All right. Okay. The New Rhetoric, Treatise on Argumentation. So, um, as you can see here, Kain Perlman and Lucy Ulbrich Sitica, and this was translated. This is like an old, it's an old work. It's even an old translation. 1969 by the University of Notre Dame Press, you know, and... So there are things about this translation that I don't love, but um, it's really a, we don't have really a lot of options here. This is the text that we have. But it was published originally, as it says, in France there in 1958. So this is a post-war text, and as the story kind of is classically told, I, I, w I should really read more on this and not just kind of go off hearsay, but Kaim Perlman, who, um, as you might guess from his name, was Jewish, Belgian uh, a Belgian Jewish man was a philosopher, but he was deeply concerned with what had happened to the public in all over Europe in light of what philosophy had promised, that reason and the Enlightenment would prevent kind of the political atrocities, the real horror that did ensue in, in Europe. So how, what should be the response to this? What should be the philosopher's response to this? And, you know, it's possible that you could say, well, really, problems, we just didn't go, we just didn't go reason, we, we weren't reasonable enough. 
And this is largely a response in the United States where emotion itself, people are like, well, the problem with politics is that Hitler and people like that were too emotional. They brought emotion into politics. People talk like this today about money, like they brought money into politics. This is a problem. We should try to get rid of that. Try to get rid of emotion. And also rhetoric, you know, this is kind of manipulative discourse. We need to go back to scientific discourse. But Perlman, for whatever reason, thought that this was this was actually part of the problem. That what we did what we had was a, a theory of argumentation in philosophy that was so based on logic uh, or a kind of idea of mathematical logic that it completely failed to anticipate or respond to the the uh, the kinds of public discourse that really exist. And so he and Lucy Albrecht Tidica spent a long time kind of compiling the material for this book. You'll find the material in this book, most of what I think people find about this book is that it's just filled with references that might not be familiar with to you. But that's, I think, in part because he's trying to make this accessible to the public of his time, a very uh, a reading public in France in his time. Uh, I'm not going to read the foreword here, but it is um, interesting to kind of know if, you, if you're if you kind of a rhetoric head, <laughs> um, who some of these n- names are that are kind of being mentioned here. Henry John Stone, you know, f- for the real rhetoric heads, K- Richard McKeon. Um, these names might be familiar to you and, and suggest the kind of people who were interested in this in its American reception. I don't know all of these people, but okay. All right, I am going to look a little bit at the table of contents just so you can get a sense of what he's doing here. Sometimes it's useful to look at the table of contents or what they're doing, I should say. <clears throat> table of contents, not just to kind of know where things are in the book, but in a book like this that is quite massive to see like, well, what's the, where is this going? What's this kind of about? If you open most treatises on argumentation, and this is true even today, it would not look like this. This would not be the arrangement. It wouldn't be thinking about things like the speaker and his audience or persuading and convin- versus convincing, the epidictic genre. Would, this wouldn't be the where you begin. It probably wouldn't be mentioned at all. You would begin with things like classical syllogism or kind of like the, 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 pro- the fallacies, the problem with fallacies or things like this. This would be the way, this is the philosophical approach to argumentation. So Perlman and, and Albrecht Tittick were trying to kind of find another way into this. They're like, the framework here is going to be based on the relationship between a speaker and audience. That's going to be the basic thing. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. But look at all this other stuff. What's the starting point of an argument? Pretty weird. Agreement? Huh? How is agreement the starting point of argument? Isn't disagreement the starting point? And the, their idea is going to be like, no, in fact, you need a lot of agreement to have an argument. You have a lot. There needs to be a lot of this stuff. You have to agree about certain values because there are things you need to appeal to when you're having an argument. These are things that are in common. So understanding where agreement is is really important. And there's some classical rhetorical theory that they're pulling on here to try to help them say that. And then they say the choice of data and their adaptation for argumentative purposes. I think data here, this is one of the things about the translation I don't like. I don't remember exactly what the French is. I, f- I think it might be donné. Um, but this gives, the, the, pretty frequently in the translation, it gives um, a kind of scientistic character to some of the things they're saying. In a, way, in a way, it doesn't have to mean that, but it tends towards that. Like it'll sometimes say research instead of something like invention, which is a rhetorical concept. And I think that this kind of hurts the spirit of the book because in some sense it's it's trying to kind of find a way out of scientism. And what is scientism? What do I mean when I say that? I think scientism is the, um, it's, it's not to say that there's a problem in scientific inquiry itself necessarily, but there's a problem in seeing all inquiry, all discourse as needing to be based in science. And this really leads to uh, not only bad public discourse, but bad science, lots of pseudoscientific kinds of claims because everyone's trying to represent what they're doing as scientific and sees the only value to be there. So data, we have to kind of think here in the broader sense of things that are kind of available for evidence in an argument. It might not mean kind of quantitative data, but the, the translation sometimes suggests that. We're not going to read this part anyway, just kind of giving you a sense of where the book goes. The presentation of data in the form of discourse. And it's kind of thinking about things that are not obviously evidence, like the form of a discourse 
You can say things like rhetorical figures come in here, and these are important for them to think about when you're considering argument. I should open up the chat on my phone just in case somebody comes in. Or if you're already here, hello, welcome to the stream. We're reading the new rhetoric. I'm so not prepared for this. <laughs> I thought I was going to have a lot of time today, but then it turned out not to be that way. I mean, I kind of did, but things just went a little bit differently than I suspected. Okay, and, um, and then part three, and this part gets kind of some interest from argumentation theorists. There's like a branch of, it's kind of weird, argumentation theory doesn't really belong to a discipline. It's kind of across multiple disciplines, including philosophy, but also in France, you'll find linguists interested in this, partly as an effect of this book, and how this book was received in France by people like Oswald Duro. And, and in Belgium, I shouldn't just say France, in the Francophone world, I should say, uh, that, that there are linguists that study argumentation. And for them, argumentation in language is important. So there's a kind of linguistic part. There's a philosophical part of argumentation theory. There are people who are kind of dialecticians. The pragma dialecticians are part of argumentation theory. It's this weird little outcropping of academic study that doesn't really have its own discipline called argumentation theory. So this book is read there, but maybe maybe only parts of it. It's been a long time since I've been to one of those conferences, but the first conference I went to, first academic conference I went to that I wasn't an ad undergraduate for was an argumentation conference. And I, it was wild. I mean, there's so much. It was very interesting. Lots of different things were being talked about there, but it was also kind of all over the place because the people who are from the different disciplines were trying to talk to each other, and they were also from different countries. So it was this kind of odd thing. I remember that being all at, on one point, there was a, a guy from France who was talking to me. And he's just like, we really wish we had a constitution like yours <laughs> so we could appeal to that in public discourse. I was like, oh, boy, <laughs> you know, grass is always greener, buddy. Um, but anyway, so, you know, you never know what, what what is bringing people there. People find their way to argumentation theory. Some, some people find their way there and um, they might be interested in this book. Okay. Real inside baseball stuff, I guess. But um, here they're kind of going to things that might look kind of technical. Arguments by comparison. Arguments of reciprocity. But you think, see things that are kind of odd, like argumentation by sacrifice. There's, some, there's things about this book that are odd to people who kind of want to read it as just another filling out of the logical argumentative tradition. And they skip those parts. Like argumentation by sacrifice. Really interesting stuff. Really interesting stuff. Arguments based on the structure of reality. So they have quasi-logical arguments and arguments based on the structure of reality. So I think that the distinction that they're trying to make here is like, okay, we have this idea that there's logical reasoning and then there's empirical stuff out in the world. And these are kind of both associated with philosophy and science. And they say, well, argumentation kind of resembles some of what we are talking about. And we're going to read the part that's, that shows us why it can't be the same. They're going to make a distinction between demonstration and argumentation. But argumentation kind of sometimes resembles something like pure reasoning. It resembles that, but it's never quite that. And then there's something that's uh, resembles something like empirical evidence in argumentation, but it's never quite that because it's the structure of reality that is always being appealed to, too. And what structure is reality? Well, there's always some kind of, there's always some aspect of the thing that structures reality that's symbolic. Probably most of it really is, but you can never fully reduce it down just to the stuff that's there. And so that symbolic element is a lot of what they're talking about here. And, it, and it's like the argument of waste, the person and his acts. It's this kind of, it's that stuff that they're really interested in. <clears throat> and then, you know, they go, go into even deeper arguments establishing the structure of reality when the argumentation kind of gets meta about that moment. And then they have this dissociation of concepts. One of the famous ones here, the appearance reality pair. It might seem like X, but really it's Y. You know, this constant gesture that's being made in discourse. They're like, let's look at that. Let's look at that kind of thing that people do commonly in argument. And then the interaction of, of arguments. And um, so there's a lot here. As you can see, it's a long book. We're just going to kind of really get into the very beginning of this, mostly because this is what they are saying is the framework of argumentation. And as you can see, a lot of it has to do with audience. Audience appears in the titles of these sections a number of times. And that's what I'm interested in in my classes for, for this piece. So it's been a, w a long time since I've assigned this piece to any of my classes or anything about anything from this book. So I'm a little, uh, hope I'm going to be thinking aloud about it with you. And uh, 
we'll see where we go. So the first section, demonstration and argumentation. The special characteristics of argumentation and the problems inherent to its study cannot be better conveyed than by contrasting argumentation with the classical concept of demonstration. And when they say classical concept in French, like the era, the classical era in France often does not refer to what we might think of as the classical, which might be kind of the ancient world. It's usually more kind of the early modern period for them. Think people like Descartes. I don't know exactly what they're they're thinking here, but I think that, that this is what they're imagining. They're talking about this early scientific philosophical, mathematical way of thinking about demonstration. And they're going to give us some examples soon. And more particularly with formal logic, which is limited to the examination of demonstrative methods of proof. In modern logic, the product of reflection on mathematical reasoning, the formal systems, are no longer related to any rational evidence whatever. No, no, they're not saying that, like, they're not saying that to slight modern logic. They're not saying it's irrational. They're saying that it doesn't require evidence because it's not based on anything empirical. A, therefore B. A, ergo B. You know, it's just kind of, it's formalized to the point that it doesn't need any kind of evidence because it simply is the demonstration of the thing. It would be like, what's your, if someone wrote some code, you'd be like, what's the evidence for it? It'd be like, no, it just works. That's the, you know, what are you talking about? I mean, even that's kind of, that's a little bit too practical here. We're talking about really abstract logic. The logician is free to elaborate as he pleases the artificial language of the system he is building, free to fix the symbols and combinations of symbols that may be used. It is for him to decide which are the axioms, that is, the expressions considered without proof as valid in his system. So in Euclid, you know, in the, the famous geometer, the, the idea that lo p lines are made up of points well, that's never proven in the system. That is an axiom. It's assumed. And other things fall, follow from that, that lines are made up of points, for instance. Okay. Um, and to say which are the rules of transformation he introduces, which will make it possible to deduce from the valid expressions, other expressions of equal validity in the system. The only obligation resting on the builder of formal axiomatic system, the one which gives the demonstrations their compelling force, is that of choosing symbols and rules in such a way as to avoid doubt and ambiguity. It must be possible without hesitation, even mechanically, to establish whether a sequence of symbols is admitted in the system, whether it is of the same form as another sequence of symbols, whether it is considered valid, because it is an axiom or an expression deducible from the axioms in a manner consistent with the rules of deduction. Now, we might take some umbrage with this and say, well, maybe, maybe in modern mathematics, really, or modern even philosophy of mathematics, there are going to be undecidable aspects of a system. And I believe that Gödel's incompleteness proof was already kind of available at the time. So, but, but this is not a technical statement. He's not saying that, that you need to kind of always instantly be able to know. That sometimes kind of there might be things that you have to deduce in a system to see whether it kind of does this number belong in this set might not be an obvious thing you might have to kind of do some work but what he's saying is that it's always possible uh, the without hesitation thing i think might be putting a little bit too too quickly there but you know in the the thing that he's imagining he's not thinking of very very complicated systems of logic he's thinking of the kinds of formal logics that are manipulating a relatively small number of systems which is what you would still learn in most logic classes anyway just in case you're a real logic head um, any consideration that has to do with the axioms of origin of the axioms or the rules of a deduction with the role that the axiomatic system is deemed to play in the elaboration of thought is far into logic conceived in this manner in the sense that it goes beyond the framework of the formalism in question. So for instance, if you're in a logic class and you're like, well, why does, why do we kind of express this with an arrow? They'd be like, oh, that's just not a question for logic. It's just a convention. There's no reason why. Or if there's a historical reason why, like it's not part of what the, this class, you know, it's maybe go read it on your own time or something, for instance. Where, where did people first begin to do this? What's the story of that? Well, that's not really a logical question. The search for unquestionable univocity, univocity, saying things with one voice, complete agreement, has even led the formalistic logicians to construct systems in which no attention is paid to the meaning of the expressions. So the semantics fall out to say a formal language, an abstract language, should not deal with semantics. Maybe later on, after we get through everything, we can kind of go back to natural language and see what it looks like. They are satisfied if the symbols introduced and the transformations concerning them are beyond discussion. 
They leave the interpretation of the elements of the axiomatic system to those who will apply it and who will have to concern themselves with its adequacy for the end pursued. With the de- when the demonstration of a proposition is in question, it is sufficient to indicate the processes by means of which the proposition can be attained as the final expression of a deductive series, which had its first elements provided by the constructor of the axiomatic system within which the demonstration is accomplished. Where these elements come from, whether they are impersonal truths, divine thoughts, results of experiment, or postulates particular to the author, these are questions with the, which the logician considers foreign to his discipline. So we can make we can kind of make rules to say if these two propositions are true, then and they're in this form, then the resulting the resulting proposition, the conclusion, would be valid and true. But we we're actually not going to go bother and see whether the propositions are true. That's kind of outside of logic, that kind of question. Or like where did they come from or who's saying them? That's not a logical question. <clears throat> but when it is a question of arguing of using discourse to influence the intensity of an audience adherence to certain theses. So there, there's a little bit of a definition they're throwing in there. Using discourse to influence the intensity of an audience's adherence to certain theses. One of the things that's nice about this definition, which is also maybe a definition of persuasion, is it's not necessarily this idea of a binary condition. I turn you from a position of unbelief to belief, or vice versa. It's kind of, it's a, it's a more of a continuous thing. It's about intensifying your adherence. So there's a kind of continuous quality. So you can be like, well, you know, I'm not sure I see it exactly the way you do, but from what you've said, you've persuaded me to see it another way. Like that would be kind of successful in, in this way of thinking about argumentation. It is no longer possible to neglect completely as irrelevancies the psychological and social conditions in the absence of which argumentation would be pointless and with, without result. For whenever in old books they italicize something, this means this is important. (laughs) For all argumentation aims at gaining the adherence of minds, and by this very fact assumes the existence of an intellectual contact. Yeah, again, here the the translation is quite ugly, and this turns a lot of people off, I think. But here, here it's kind of, if we're thinking about argumentation, we have to be thinking about other minds, or... Minds might here even be too limited. We just have to be thinking about others. And, and logic doesn't require that, and in some sense doesn't admit it. It does not admit others, or even self. So this kind of is argumentation, if logic is kind of true in any world, argumentation is only valid in our world. Might be another way to put it, in some kind of philosophical sense. For argumentation to exist... An effective community of minds must be realized at a given moment. There must first of all be agreement in principle on the formation of this intellectual community, and after that, on the fact of debating a specific question together. Now, this does not come out automatically. We have to kind of create it. Even in this realm of inward deliberation, certain conditions are required for argumentation. In particular, a person must conceive of himself as divided into at least two interlocutors to parties engaging in deliberation. Now, this is, I mean, already right here in section one, something that you'll, I don't think you'll ever see in like a public speaking textbook even, much less a logical textbook. A person must conceive of themselves as divided into two. Is a weird place to begin a theory of argumentation. But it makes a lot of sense after a while of practicing this. For me, it's very kind of, people, sometimes my students will be like, I don't know where to begin. I don't know what to say. What should I be saying? And it's, uh, I sympathize with this feeling that they have. And I try to kind of say, well, you have to start. <laughs> Where do you start? Somewhere? Because the process is you say something and then you become an audience for what you say. You have to kind of have this ability to move back and forth between two roles of becoming your own audience in order to develop an argument or to pr- develop a speech. So this is, I think, a powerful place to begin, if, if a little bit strange. And there is no warrant for regarding this division as necessary. It appears to be constructed on the model of deliberation with others. Hence, and, and so here necessary probably means it's not logically necessary, it just is like kind of what comes about in the world. Anyway, translation problems abound here, really, especially early on in this text. Hence, we must expect to find carried over to this inner deliberation most of the problems associated with the conditions necessary for discussion with others. Many expressions bear witness to this, 
but two examples may suffice. The first, relating to preliminary conditions as they affect persons, is such a saying as, don't listen to your evil genius. <laughs> so you, you know that old saying. So what's, what do they mean by your evil genius? Genius is uh, the Latin for a version of the daimon, the Greek daimon, which was kind of like yourself, but yourself kind of considered outside of yourself. Uh, like it was something that would kind of counsel you. Anyway, you don't need to go all the weird ideas. But it's kind of, maybe we would say, uh, listen to the better angel of your nature, would be maybe a, a kind of version of our saying. A little bit Lincolnized. Because, you know, that's a Lincoln idea. The other having to do with preliminary conditions, as they affect the object of argumentation, is a saying like, don't bring that up anymore. <laughs> so that's kind of a weird thing to say. That these are the two preliminary conditions. It'll be a little bit clearer as we go why they're kind of beginning here. But these are um, these are kind of establishing that realm of agreement, being like, okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna value those things, we have nothing in common. Be like, no, 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 come, come to the come to the thing that we we both value. Or that's not interesting to me. That's not important to me. So there has to be interest. There has to be importance. There has to be kind of some idea of a possibility at least of a shared value for argumentation to begin. So there needs to be a lot of stuff. There needs to be a whole world of agreement before we can begin to argue. Disagreement might incite us into argumentation, but for it to, to sustain itself more than a second or two, and it's just kind of, I'm going to flip off the bird at the guy that cut me off. That's not really argumentation. I don't need to give any reasons for that. I don't, I'm not going to bother with this guy, telling him why he's uh, a jerk to cut me off. When I'm arguing with someone, I'm giving them reasons for why I stand there because I value their mind in some way, even if I think they might be mistaken about something. Okay, before I go into section two, I'm going to get a drink because um, it's summer and the weekend and I want to. Oh man, there's so much stuff going on on my phone. But um, this is going to be this is going to be nice, I think. I'm looking forward to reading this again. One second. I also, um, I probably, I didn't even update like the, the, the content of the stream. So it still says black light reading hour knots or whatever, but the black light that I've been using <laughs> is like really dangerous because <laughs> it's really old and like, I can't even unplug it safely. So I might go back to that, but I, I might, um, I might have to kind of invest in a new black light because that one that's going to start a fire. Um, so I need to, I need to retire that, but, um, This is probably too late to do this anyway, but whatever. Ah. I'm starting to get really annoyed at predictive text. Like, how do you think you know what I'm going to say? I had to turn it off in Outlook where it was making it impossible for me to write emails. <laughs> it kept changing all of my sentences. I was, it was taking, I was like, okay, no. No more predictive text in emails. Um, terrible. I might not be saying the same shit that everyone else is saying. Leave me alone. All right, the contact of minds. Here we go. Uh, I'm making this a very, a very uh, prickly. I'm feeling very. I'm not feeling prickly, but I'm saying prickly things. But let me be chill and talk about the contact of minds. Okay, a whole set of conditions is required for the formation of an effective community of minds. The indispensable minimum for argumentation appears to be the existence of a common language, of a technique allowing communication to take place. So we can't get very far if we don't know how to speak to one another. So when Montezuma and Cortez are having their colloquies, they need an interpreter. And uh, Malinche, as she was known, is kind of an interesting figure in the history of... Um, Mesoamerican and Latin American culture today because in some sometimes she's been villain, vilified being if you're going to create the the conditions for the communication between the Spanish conquistadores and us the indigenous indigenous people you're responsible for everything 
And at other times, people have kind of honored her as a hero. So how do we feel about that, that establishing that channel? Sometimes maybe we shouldn't establish that channel. This is kind of Star Trek, Prime Directive. Sometimes the ethical thing would be to say, no channel should exist. This culture doesn't have warp drive, warp technology. So if we were to have a culture of, if we were to have a channel of communication, we would, uh, we would destroy their culture, not by any, not because we wanted to, just because our contact would have an effect. So this question of making contact is itself is an important question to, to think about. Or uncontacted peoples that exist on Earth. There's a lot of debate sometimes about whether about some anthropologists who try to make contact with them. And other people being like, if you do that, this is like really evil because maybe you have diseases that they are not immune to or you're just going to kind of like ruin their civilization or whatever. So um, that's not something that's always obviously there. But in most cases, today in our world, there is some way to get in communication with really anybody if we would want to. There'd be some kind of translation service. There'd be available. There'd be someone who would be able to translate between a language and another one. It might take a while to get <clears throat> what we want to say there, but... It would be kind of possible. How much is getting through in that channel? It's going to vary a lot. It's going to vary a lot. But the minimum is not enough. No one knows shows this better than the author of Alice in Wonderland. They use Alice in Wonderland as one of their go-to examples. So hopefully you've read Alice in Wonderland or at least seen the Disney movie. But Did they make a live-action one now? I have not seen that. But um, I assume it's worse. <laughs> Uh, the beings inhabiting that country understand Alice's language more or less, but her problem is to make contact in an open discussion. As in In Wonderland, there is no reason why discussion should be in. The inhabitants know no reason for speaking to one another. On some occasions, Alice takes the initiative, as when she plainly addresses the mouse with the vocative. Oh, mouse. The vocative just means the part of language where you address someone. And she considers it a success to have managed the exchange of a few rather pointless remarks with the Duchess. And, and, you know, they're just giving us the pages where to go, so you can go find it if you want. However, in her earlier attempt at conversation with the caterpillar, a deadlock is immediately reached. I think you ought to tell me who you are first, she says. Why, says the caterpillar. <laughs> Why should I tell you who I am? Um, in our well-ordered world with its hierarchies, there are generally rules prescribing how conversation may be begun. There's a preliminary agreement arising from the norms set by social life. Between Alice and the inhabitants of Wonderland, no hierarchy precedence or functions requires one to answer rather than another. Even those conversations which do begin are apt to break off suddenly. The Laurie, for instance, prides himself on his age. The Laurie? That can't be right. What is that supposed to be? I don't remember that one from Alice in Wonderland. This Alice would not allow without knowing how old he was, and as the Laurie positively refused to tell its age, there was no more to be said. The only preliminary condition fulfilled here is Alice's wish to enter into conversation with the beings of this new universe. I have to say, m a much better example for this. I am American. I don't know if it's if you can tell. <laughs> I am American, but but it's it's one of the great pieces of American fiction, which is Herman Melville's short story Bartleby the Scrivener. And in Bartleby, you you are from the perspective of a, a 19th century Wall Street. He's some kind of executive, but you have to imagine it's very different back then. So it's mostly legal stuff that he's dealing with. And so he has in his office employed all these different guys who kind of copy contracts by hand all day long. And this is what one of the, what Bartleby is. And they have different temperaments and he can only, they, they, some of them do neat work in the morning, some at the evening and stuff. There's all these kinds of problems about their personalities. But Bartleby is the strangest personality because he seems to be doing fine, whole, like copy, 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 copy. But you know, he, when he wants him to do something else, he'll invite him in and say, Bartleby, can you do this? And he say, I would prefer not to. And he's like, what, what? And the boss doesn't know what to do because he's never even, it's never even occurred to him that in, his, in this discourse where he's the boss that someone would say, I would prefer not to. He's not outright refusing. He's just saying, I would prefer not to. Then he goes back to his cubicle and just does nothing. And then the whole story is about how like, he keeps just saying this over and over again. And the boss is kind of going crazy being like, he doesn't know how to respond. I think this is a more interesting example. But anyway, the set of those the set of those a speaker wishes to address may vary very considerably. For any particular speaker, it falls far short of all human beings. Yeah, I mean, there certainly are moments where, and they're going to talk about a kind of idea of universal audience. It might be worth noting here that they're going to say 
all the stuff about universal audience, how important it is. But right away, even before they get there, say, nobody can speak to all human beings. People might kind of have the pretense that they're doing that, or they might kind of imagine that they're doing that, but, but really nobody is doing that. No one is speaking to all human beings. In the case of a child, however, to whom the adult world is in varying measure closed, the universe he wants to address is correspondingly extended by the inclusion of animals. Excuse me. And all the inanimate objects he regards as his natural interlocutors. So there's no reason to even think that human ta humans are the limit of it. Or even you can think about lots of different cultures where you might talk to different kinds of spirits. You might talk to your ancestral spirits or... St. Francis of Assisi might talk to the birds or Brother Moon or things like this. There might be various kinds of audiences that are not even human. People talk to their pets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These, there are beings with whom any contact may seem superfluous or undesirable. There are those someone cannot be bothered to talk to. There are others with whom one does not wish to discuss things, but to whom one merely gives orders. So if you're in a situation, you know, you're in the barracks and the drill sergeant comes in. You're not in a mode of argumentation unless you kind of get to full metal jacket kind of situation and then, then things are scary. If you kind of know what you're supposed to say, you're just kind of, you're going to take the orders, right? This is not an argumentative discourse. This is command. Different. Different kind of engagement. To engage in argument, a person must attach some importance to gaining the adherence of his interlocutor, to securing his assent, his mental cooperation. It is accordingly sometimes a valued honor to be a person with whom another will enter into a discussion or really a debate or an argument. It's kind of an honor to be like, well, thank you for doing this. <laughs> it's not how we usually feel, is it? That would kind of change things around if we thought about that way. Well, thank you for taking the time to argue with me online. <laughs> because of the rationalism and the humanism of the last few centuries, it seems a strange notion that the mere fact of being someone whose opinion is taken into account should constitute a quality. But in many societies, a person will no more talk to just anybody than in the past, a man would fight a duel with just anybody. <laughs> you can't insult my honor unless you have a sufficient amount of honor to insult me. You know, if somebody on the street, some street urchin were to say something, it wouldn't insult my honor because, of course, they're just a street urchin. So there's a little bit of irony here that's maybe lost because these, these references are to a past that is not so vivid to us, perhaps, but... I think it's, it's a little bit ironic. Not disingenuous, just ironic. It is also to be observed that wanting to convince someone always implies a certain modesty on the part of the initiator of the argument. What he says is not gospel truth. He does not possess that authority which would place his words beyond question so that they would carry immediate conviction. So, for instance, when uh, the Prophet Muhammad is receiving the Quran from from Jibreel when it's revealed to him. Jibreel doesn't have to say, well, here's why. <laughs> here's why this is the Quran. Jibreel is never going to make the argument. It is revealed. And then when Muhammad kind of recites the Asura to his the community, sometimes after really long pauses, it turns out. It's very interesting. He'll be like, kind of go into his tent and he'll have to be like silent for hours or days even. And then they come out and just recite this whole thing. Must have been kind of a, an amazing uh, thing to witness, this kind of revelation before someone. There's, there's not a moment where you kind of say, well, why is that the case? And if you're doing that, you're not relating to it as revelation. So the other Arab tribes, or the Arab tribes that were, or families, I should say, like the Quraysh that Muhammad was kind of from, but also in contest with, they would do this sometimes. They would relate to some of his revelation and say, but what about this? And so they were relating to it as him as a kind of another interlocutor that they could argue with and not as a prophet that was revealing the truth. It's very, it's a very different modality. Um, okay. He acknowledges that he must use persuasion. Think of arguments capable of acting on his interlocutor. Show some concern for him and be interested in his state of mind. A person, whether an adult or a child, who wants to count with others wishes that they would stop giving him orders and would instead reason with him and concern themselves with his reactions. He wants to be regarded as a member of a more or less equalitarian society. A man who does not cultivate this kind of contact with his fellows will be thought a proud, unattractive creature, <laughs> as opposed 
uh, or as compared with one who, however important his functions, take pains to address the public in a manner which makes clear the value he attaches to its appreciation. Uh, yeah, but I, I think that part's pretty clear. But as has been said many times, it is not always commendable to wish to persuade someone. So, on the one hand, it seems like it's generally a value to be like, okay, you know, I'm willing to kind of persuade you, I'm treating you as an equal. But there are times where, it, on certain topics or er issues, it would not be. The conditions under which contact between minds may takes place may indeed appear to be rather dishonorable. The reader will recall the story of Aristippus, who, when he was reproached for having objectively prostrated himself at the feet of Dionysius the tyrant, this is happening in the kind of ancient Greek world. Uh, he's the tyrant of Syracuse, I believe. Go orange. In order to be heard by him, defended himself by saying that the fault was not his, but that of Dionysius, who had his ears in his feet. Which is kind of uh, being like, oh, no, you only hear people when we grovel for you. We don't, you only hear things down there. That's not so. So some got some like if you go into uh, some executive who has this reputation, some C-suite executive has this reputation for being a kind of Gary V type, let's say, and um, you kind of approach, you kind of wait for permission to be told to sit. You're like, oh, have a seat. You know, don't 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 be so weak that you ask me to sit down. And be like, oh no, it's okay. It's just that uh, I've noticed you don't hear people unless uh, you give them permission first. And that would be kind of a real insult to that, but would would show the situation. That's really happening there. The danger seen by Aristotle in carrying on discussion with some people is that the speaker may thereby destroy the quality of his argumentation. A man should not enter into discussion with everybody or practice dialectics with the first comer as reasoning always becomes embittered where some people are concerned. Indeed, when an adversary tries by every possible means to wriggle out of a corner, it is legitimate to strive by every possible means to reach the conclusion. But this procedure lacks elegance. There are going to be some people who are going to treat argument not as something that's open to possibility. And so in these cases, the elegant <laughs> um, arguer might just say, hmm, not worth it. There can't really be a good argument made here in the, under these conditions. Not because I couldn't make it, maybe, but because it won't be received. It's not possible. So there are these limitations, these moments of judgment. This is not going to appear in a logic text. I mean, maybe if you read Aristotle, I guess, but in a modern logical text, they're not going to talk about these kinds of problems. It is not enough for a man to speak or write. He must also be listened to or read. It is no mean thing to have a person's attention, to have a wide audience, to be allowed to speak under certain circumstances, in certain gatherings, in certain circles. We must not forget that by listening to someone, we display a willingness to eventually accept his point of view. Okay. It's allergy season now. I took a walk today. I knew I was going to suffer for it a little bit because I could see the the uh, clumps of tree pollen. So now I'm feeling it a little bit, but so far it's so so good. It's not too bad. Oh boy, <laughs> jinx! There is great significance in the attitude of a Churchill forbidding British diplomats even to listen to any peace proposals German emissaries might try to convey, or in the attitude of a political party when it makes known its willingness to he hear any proposals a politician engaged in forming a ministry because they prevent the establishment or recognize the existence of the conditions preliminary to possible argumentation. So there's a lot, I mean, this is a, a huge area of concern in our country, the United States, both by people who think of this as a kind of key strategy of politics, which might be deplatforming, <clears throat> not having discourse with those who have certain opinions or attitudes that are beyond the pale. And um, I did read the news today and recently and saw the horrible thing that happened. And I'm not going to talk about it. Except to say, there, there's already kind of an argument that what caused this horror is discourse that appears on television. So what should happen is that person is removed from television. Makes sense uh, from a certain point of view. And there's also people who say all of this desire to deplatform people shows the intolerance of usually the left in, in, in this country. That's how it goes. The intolerance. And this is what needs to be fought again. We need to have an open, vibrant culture of, of communication and argument and debate. Um, now, uh, I think that it's always interesting to have this question open to us. 
there's always the possibility that you can kind of leave an argument. And I like to find some moments, historical moments, where people left arguments or left some form of communication as a way of signaling to others that this was beyond the pale, that they, that they could not continue. But it also often, the, the upshot of that, or maybe the downside, depending on how you look at it, is that that can become an argument for others. They can say, look, they're not even willing to debate. They're not reasonable. I mean, this is, of course, that's going to be available as an argument, should you do that. So how can we do this? Well, now, if you have the authority of state to do this with, to say, well, these people should not, these people are not allowed to make political parties. People that have this political identity are not allowed to have political parties, which appears in a lot of constitutions around the world. Or, very recently, the German government banned a protest by Jüdische Stimme, a Jewish group, protesting the killing of a Palestinian journalist by IDF troops. And they banned it under a provision that um, forbids anti-Semitic speech. So this is a Jewish group being forbid or being kind of prevented from a protest under a law preventing anti-Semitism. Very, very strange stuff. So there's lots of ways that this can kind of go. Achievement of the conditions preliminary to the contact of minds is facilitated by such factors as membership in the same social class, exchange of visits and other social relations. Frivolous discussions that are lacking in apparent interest are not always entirely unimportant, and as much as they contribute to the smooth working of an indispensable social mechanism. Hmm. I mean, should we always want it to be smooth? Maybe this is one of the problems. It's like it's a little bit too smooth, too oily, too greasy, unctuous. There's a reason that those metaphors kind of come to describe a certain way of speaking or talking. It's just always kind of like greasing the wheels. Sometimes we might say with Mario Savio, we need to throw our bodies on the gears of the machine to make it stop. So this too can be a kind of area of disagreement. Three, the speaker and his audience. And of course, this language is gendered. Language is gendered, uh, but I'm going to read it as it's written. The authors of scientific reports and similar papers often think that if they merely report certain experiments, mention certain facts, or enunciate a certain number of truths, this is enough of itself to automatically arouse the interest of their hearers or readers. Hello. Um, the Hey, what's up, Steve? We're getting to we're getting some good stuff here. Thanks for uh, stopping by the stream. I'm just kind of I've been talking about really important things like my allergies and <laughs> but also a little bit about the new rhetoric. So it's enough if I if I just report on certain experiments. Well, science says, science says reports have reports have established these kinds of things. You just have to say this. And somehow the truth the truth shall set you free. Hmm, something like that. Or if people don't kind of respond to the truth as a signal, if they don't see the truth, then they're stupid. There's a flaw in them. The problem is with them, not with he, not with the way that you're communicating. This attitude rests on the illusion, widespread in certain rationalistic and scientific circles, that facts speak for themselves and make such an indelible imprint on any human mind that the latter is forced to give its adherence regardless of its inclination. I mean, I, I feel like I've, I talk about this so much. It's become kind of more like a... Pre I feel like the, it's a pressure on my brain. Because to me, the evidence speaks for itself that this is not the case. <laughs> Just like, look, like you keep doing this and people are not persuaded. You know, you keep saying that these are the facts and people are not persuaded. So what would convince you that that's not the truth, that that's not how things work? I think it's more that this is a kind of moralized position. This is why it's scientistic. It's a moralized position. It's not really concerned with whether this is persuasive or not. It's it's kind of a, it alleviates you from lots of responsibilities about communication. You're like, well, if they're not willing to listen to the truth, then what can be done? Then I don't have to worry about them anymore. It's not that different from being like, well, you know, someone's asking for money. If, if they spend a little more time looking for a job, then maybe they wouldn't have to ask for money. Not my problem. So, I don't know. Is that a fair is that a fair metaphor? I don't know. What would science say? An editor of a psychological journal, is, journal, Catherine F. Bruner, likens such authors who do not worry very much about their audience. I love this example. 
to discourteous visitors. They slouch into a chair, staring glumly at their shoes, and abruptly announce to themselves or not, we never know. It has been shown by such and such that the female of the white rat responds negatively to electric shock. <laughs> All right, sir, I say. So what? <laughs> Tell me first why I should care. Then I will listen. Right? Isn't that so basic? Why should I be listening to you? Every time you speak, you're kind of asking for people's attention. And this is, there's implicitly a claim here that something that you say has value, that you believe that has value for others to listen to. And um, I, I, it's, it's interesting how, how that kind of has changed in print culture as well. For, for hundreds of years, in, when books were published right from the printing press on, they were almost always, and this is in Europe, um, I, but I know that there are similar um, conventions in other cultures and languages. But there were, there were these long letters to the reader uh, that would come before the books. And pretty much most of the time, the person would kind of perform this. It was even called a humility topos. It was a conventionalized form of humility of saying, but sometimes there would be multiple letters. Sometimes it would be addressed to the friend. So you'd have a friend. You'd say, my friend who, who forced me to write this book, I just wanted this to be a private conversation, and I don't think there's any value in this at all. But because you <laughs> have said there's so much value here and you've kind of forced me to write this, or, or sometimes they would say, and sometimes this did happen, but they'd be like, someone stole the manuscript and published it in a worse form, so I'm going to publish it in, a, in, a, in the right form. So at least there's no errors, and any errors that you do find lie with me, not with the publisher, blah, 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 blah. This humility to a point. Or they'd say, reader, you know, um, I know that there's no value here in this in this work, but if you've taken the time to read this, if you're making the mistake to listen to this, then then here's some things you might kind of think about, or here's why it might be valuable, or something like that. So you have to kind of be humble about some kind of coming to your book. People would kind of, bra if you would brashly say at the beginning of the book, it's not, I mean, there were people that did, like Luther, for instance, Martin Luther, <laughs> who would just be like, you know, I'm here to, sh to clean things up. All these other idiots don't understand what's happening. But now that's kind of, that's, that's um, a pretty common way to begin discourse. Just talking about how, how people are so wrong and confused. And you're here to sh set things straight. What if some of those wrong, confused people are the people you're talking to? How do you think they might respond? Anyway, it is true that these authors, when addressing a learned society or publishing an article in a specialized journal, can afford to neglect the means of entering into contact with the Republic. For the indispensable link between speaker and audience is provided by, by a scientific institution, the society, or the journal. If I go into the subreddit, um, uh, ask -o my seats, I don't need to kind of be like, hey, um, just so you know, I think mushrooms are cool. Here's why. Those people already all like mushrooms. They're, that's why they're there. And if there's someone that's not, that's there that doesn't like it, then they kind of know that they're there for a weird reason. <laughs> so they kind of would be imagining themselves as being an outsider already. They'd be kind of like, be like, oh yeah, I guess it's got, I got to figure out what's going on here. But, but most of the time that's not what's happening. So the, like a specific journal, a trade journal or something like that. Or if you go to a certain kind of party, maybe you're like, okay, we can assume a few things about the people here. In such a case, then the author has merely to maintain between himself and the public the contact already established by the scientific institution. So you just don't violate the, the norms of how people talk there. So you have to learn those. There's still something to learn. My dearly beloved, you wouldn't start your scientific paper like that. And you shouldn't end it with saying, no further research must be done. You need to always kind of say, further research might show this, blah, 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 blah. Because the institution needs to continue. The discourse needs to always be able to imagine itself continuing, kind of indefinitely, in these scientific journals. But not everyone is in such a privileged position. For argumentation to develop, there must be some attention paid to it by those to whom it is directed. The prime concern of publicity and propaganda is to draw the attention of an indifferent public, this being the indispensable condition for carrying on any sort of argumentation. An indifferent public. I think this is kind of where we, we are more often than not, is that we're kind of not in a place where we have a clear attitude towards something. And the, uh, advertising supplies a lot of this, where we're kind of just open channels. And ads will try to kind of read our general attitude or mood and say, how can we connect that mood, that general vibe, to this product or to this thing? So that you're no longer indifferent towards it. But if we are not just thinking about selling stuff, if we're not just thinking about advertisement, 
Indifference might also be a problem in addressing a public. A public might be indifferent out of ignorance of something. You might be ignorant towards an issue because you just have never heard of it. Or you might be indifferent because you don't understand why you should care. So indifference might be something that needs to be overcome. It is true that in a large number of fields, such as those of education, politics, science, the administration of justice, any society possesses institutions which facilitate and organize this contact of minds. But the importance of this preliminary problem must not be underrated on that account. I mean, really, if anything, they don't spend enough time on this problem because, uh, or I mean, it's, not, it's kind of beyond, in some sense, what they're trying to do here. But the, the contact of minds kind of being, having pre-established forms, doesn't that describe the vast majority of where we are? That when we're on a certain kind of social media platform, that platform is already brought us into some kind of contact and it's established all sorts of implicit and maybe actually unknowable rules, algorithmic rules of how we're going to be in contact with one another. And those are not kind of accessible to us. They're not things that we can argue with. So that institutional side of discourse, the part that is kept out of argumentation because you have to abide by the norms of the institution or the, the technological forms of the institution are such that you, you just can't even access what those rules are, something like that. Or there's a lot of threats to it, you know, in the law, for instance, of violating it. This, this shapes discourse quite a lot. This might be even the more important thing to consider in some situations than the quality of argumentation because it's just so dominant. But we can hold out hope that there might be some places where, even given that shaping of the contact of minds, as they're calling it, there's still some importance to how we argue. And if, if we didn't believe that, then really there's no reason for reading this text. If, you, if you're really cynical, then um, you can just kind of click out here. Under normal circumstances, some quality is necessary in order to speak to and be listened to. It's interesting to call it a quality. Like, I'm speaking to our quality. Thinking of an audience that way is already better than what most public speaking textbooks say. Of speaking to kind of a, a various set of individuals, kind of aggregated together. Or speaking to a stereotypical idea, idea of an identity or somehow doing that. Speaking to a quality in the audience. That might be a better way to think about it. In our civilization, where the printed word has become a commodity and utilizes economic organization to draw attention to itself, this preliminary condition is seen clearly only in cases where contact between the speaker and his audience cannot be brought about by the techniques of distribution. It's accordingly best seen where argumentation is developed by a speaker who is orally addressing a specific audience. Yay! Rather than where it is contained in a book on sale in a bookstore. This quality in a speaker, without which he will not be listened to, or even in many cases allowed to speak, will vary with the circumstances. Sometimes it will be enough for the speaker to appear as a human being, with a decent suit of clothes. Sometimes he is required to be an adult. Sometimes he must be a rank-and-file member of a particular group. Sometimes the spokesman of this group. Under certain circumstances or before certain audiences, the only admissible authority for speaking is the exercise of particular functions. There are fields where these matters of qualification to speak are regulated in very great detail. So even before you open your mouth, if you're allowed to speak, all sorts of other things have kind of been agreed upon. Institutionally or otherwise. Socially, they're kind of pointing out all of this stuff. This contact between the speaker and his audience is not confined to the conditions of prelimi that preliminary to argumentation. It is equally necessary if argumentation is to develop. So maybe you kind of get a hearing. You kind of come down to the, the, uh, the courthouse or the town hall meeting. I went to one of these once where... There is a kind of public opening where they say, come down, we're kind of debating a bill, and we want to have input from the public. So it was just kind of a series of people speaking, and it was about an environmental issue. And, and people, would they're like, you have, the conditions for your speech are you have, I think it was three minutes. It wasn't a whole lot of time, but there were a lot of people. You kind of stand up to the mic and you kind of get going. And so you're, as a citizen or Whatever, I forget what you need to show. In a, you can basically just show up. Put your name down. You're on the list. You can speak. But if you feel like you really want to be taken seriously, you might need to do some work to kind of say why you are speaking on this issue. Who are you? Why are you concerned? You might not just want to rely on the fact that, yeah, you're allowed to speak because you kind of recognize that, sure, they're going to listen to all of this stuff and most of it's probably not going to matter if any of it at all is. So you kind of have to do a little bit of work to try to make your speech matter. And that is kind of creating 
those conditions of contact. So some people would kind of say, come up and say, well, I worked. Like, my family's from West Virginia. I remember the guy that before me was like this. He's like, my family's from West Virginia. I lived in that land my whole life. And, these, and the coal company wants to represent itself as helping us. No, they took from us. And so he was establishing his credibility to talk about this because of his history and his family, things like that. For since argumentation aims at securing the adherence of those to whom it is addressed, it is in its entirety relative to the audience to be influenced. How may such an audience be defined? Is it just the person whom the speaker addresses by name? Not always. Thus, a member of parliament in England must address himself to the speaker, but he may not try to persuade those listening, but he may try to persuade those listening to him in the chamber and beyond that public opinion throughout the country. This is not the best example because it's obviously just a formality of the the house of not lords of uh, commons that you address the speaker when you're speaking, which is kind of funny. You, know, you address the speaker, uh, the speaker of the house. It's obviously just a formality. But there are other situations where it might be clear where you're kind of addressing someone and you want to be overheard. They want someone else to hear you, but like you're kind of having this interviews or maybe like this. Like you are really talking to that person, but um, the whole purpose of the interview is that it's going to be published and other people are going to read it or hear it or see it, right? So you're kind of really more talking to the, those other people that are not there. Again, can an audience be defined as the group of persons the speaker sees before him when he speaks? Not necessarily. He may perfectly well disregard a portion of them. A government spokesman in Parliament may give up any hope of convincing the opposition, even before he begins to speak, and may be satisfied with getting the adherence of his majority. And on the other hand, oh, what's up, Alan? Good to see you around. Welcome. Oh, by the way, Alan, I was thinking of you the other day because you, um, you were the first person to tell me about rubber ducking in computer engineering, software engineering, as a kind of technique that people use, and it's very helpful. The students are like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because a lot of them are, are software engineers. So thanks again for that uh, little tidbit. I appreciate that. I hope you're doing well. Um, again, can such an audience be defined as the group of persons the speaker sees before him when he speaks? Not necessarily. Now, isn't that crazy? Isn't that what most people think? Okay, my audience, these people. And they're like, no, not even that. Not even the people that you see before you in the room. Well, why not? Oh, we already said that. Okay, because you can disregard a portion of that. And on the other hand, a person granting an interview to a journalist. Now, I thought this is my own example, but I guess I just remembered this. Granting an interview to a journalist considers his audience to be not the journalist himself, but the readers of the paper he represents. The secrecy of deliberations by modifying the speaker's opinion of his audience may change the content of his speech. It is at once apparent from these few examples how difficult it is to determine by purely material criteria what constitutes a speaker's audience. The difficulty is even greater in the case of a writer's audience, as in most cases it is impossible to identify his readers with certainty. So then what is audience? And it kind of becomes mystical or spooky for a little bit. But they're going to try to help us not, I don't think that what they want to do is just kind of mystify the question. I think what they want to do is ask a better question. Who is the audience beyond this simplistic way of looking at it isn't just because that's too simple, but because that simple way of looking at audience will mislead us into thinking about things the wrong way. And we can see this in some of the public speaking textbooks, for instance, that say, yeah, your audience is the people in front of you. And then they recommend, I should find the book that actually does this. So I don't, you know, I don't blame all public speaking textbooks, but I read this once in this public speaking textbook. So what you should do is take a questionnaire ahead of time of your audience <laughs> See what they think and then speak to that, which is just the most insane advice ever for multiple reasons, which is, well, what happens if they don't all have the same opinion? What do you do now? It's, it just doesn't make any sense to think of it that way. But, um, but yeah, we, we get a better sense of audience by kind of finding the trouble with the simple view of saying, oh, yeah, it's those people I'm speaking to. For this reason, we consider it preferable to define an audience for the purposes of rhetoric as the ensemble of those whom the speaker wishes to influence by his argumentation. So the speaker's desire is part of who the audience is. And there's already a weird kind of context there. If you are the kind of person I desire to influence, how do I even know that? Well, I don't really know that until you imagine yourself a certain way. So there's this kind of openness in that definition. Every speaker thinks more or less consciously of those he is seeking to persuade. These people form the audience to whom the speech is addressed. 
Okay, and so then this kind of leads us into this, the next section, the audience as a construction of the speaker, which for me no longer this seems kind of like and the first time I read it I, I kind of remember being like yeah I yeah obvious but I really don't think this is obvious it's obvious maybe to people who are studying rhetoric or maybe not even it, it's obvious if you spend a lot of your time speaking publicly or thinking about speech because you're you're doing this a lot you're constructing an audience in your speech but this is a kind of like, maybe, maybe we should let the idea be weird the audience is something the speaker makes. One way I like, they'll really give their theory of it here in a minute. But one way you can think about this that I found helpful is in a speech or in a text, there's a kind of part of the text or the speech that asks you to see yourself in it in some way, more or less directly. Sometimes it can be very oblique. It can be a kind of uh, a, a way of speaking of saying well if you know how what this way of speaking sounds like or the if you if you get the attitude that's communicated here you're 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 the person i'm speaking to and sometimes it'll be kind of direct be like if you you're either with us or against us okay but it's more or less like there's a moment in the speech and really throughout the speech there are different aspects of, of it that allow us to see ourselves relating to it or not it's relatable and so the the speaker in thinking of that as part of their speech and, and creating a speech that allows you to see yourself in it is creating the audience. The audience is that space that allows the real audience to see itself in it. It's one way to think about it, maybe. The audience as visualized by one undertaking to argue is always a more or less systematized construction. See, this kind of gives you the wrong... The wrong I, have, I wonder what the French there is. Syst more or less systematized construction. That gives you the wrong impression, I think. Efforts have been made to establish its psychological or sociological origins. Uh, and they give you some Harry Stack Sullivan down here if you want to get into that, but whatever. The essential consideration for the speaker who has set himself the task of persuading concrete individuals is that his construction of the audience should be adequate to the occasion. This does not hold for someone engaged in mere essay making without concern for real life. Now, I'm, I, I wonder what, <laughs> what they're imagining here. Surely not Montaigne, who they cite a huge number of times because... But they're, they're, they're imagining some kind of person that's maybe maybe more like the kind of guardian columnist. Someone who's writing just to kind of, because they're a columnist, they have to write. <laughs> I don't know. Rhetoric, which has then become an academic exercise. Maybe they're thinking of just kind of school essays, the five paragraph essays. Rhetoric, which has become an academic exercise, is addressed to conventional audiences of which such rhetoric can afford to have stereotyped conceptions. You learn how to write an essay for school but if you ever read that kind of essay outside of school, you'd be horrified. You'd be like, what? If you opened a, a magazine and it was like, in this article, I will prove the following thesis. You'd be like, what? This is trash. And you throw it away. However, is this limited view of the audience as much as artificiality of subject matter, which is responsible for the degeneration of rhetoric? And they're, they're sounding a kind of a note of lamentation here, which is as old as the hills. In real argumentation, care must be taken to form a concept of the anticipated audience as close as possible to reality. An inadequate picture of the audience. See, again, I keep thinking that I'm like, oh, I thought this, it's just them. I just kind of have absorbed this. An inadequate picture of the audience resulting from either ignorance or an unfortunate set of circumstances can have very unfortunate results. Argumentation, which an orator considers persuasive, may well cause opposition in an audience for which reasons for, reasons for, are actually reasons against. We should do this in order to show the rest of the world that we're powerful and we're ready to strike back. Okay, uh, actually, if that's your reason for, I think that's for me a reason against. I'm not sure that's what we should do. Yeah. Thus, if one argues for a certain measure that it is likely to reduce social tension, such argument will set against the measure of all those who would like to see disturbances. You're like, oh, we need to kind of be more civil and relaxed. Be like, yeah, no, what we need to do is heighten the contradictions. We, we could see, we have different ideas about what we should be doing. Accordingly, knowledge of those one wishes to win over is a condition preliminary to all effectual argumentation. This is true and commonly said, but, but here they're going to give an idea of knowing your audience that's pretty different from, I would say, a kind of vulgar sociology of audience. Know your audience by being like, oh, you know, they're kids. I guess they're into, uh, <laughs> I guess they're into Minecraft. And we were kind of in the Steve Buscemi meme of, hey, fellow kids, 
where everyone can kind of see that you're reading them as uh, an uncomplicated stereotype. And not only does that not establish contact of minds, it, it kind of leads people to see you even less connected to them. Because you're like, oh, what do you think I am? You think I'm just some stereotype? Concern with the audience transforms certain chapters in the classical treatises on rhetoric into veritable studies in psychology. For instance, in the passage of the rhetoric dealing with the factors of age and fortune in audiences, this is in book two of the rhetoric, curious to see where data analytics comes into play here. Before you, probably before you came to the stream, they, um, we were talking a little bit about the, about the fact, I'll come back to this, page 18, that they talk about data in this translation. I forget again what the, what the French is. But they talk a lot about data. Selection of data and presence, the choice of data, the presentation of data. I mean, huge parts of this book are being given to thinking about data. But probably their way of thinking about data is going to be very different from what we mean by it uh, today. Well, or at least it would seem different at first. But I think for them, this, this chapter, if you're interested in this, Alan, you might read this little section here, the interpretation of data. Well, both of these really. Uh, sections 29 and 30. That might be a kind of the part of this. We're not going to get there tonight, but if you're interested in, in that question, maybe read those sections, and you'll see what they say. I think it's very interesting and very helpful, but um, a very a very quick maybe vision of what they're going to argue there is to say, the selection of what is important, what evidence is important. Oh, the book is The New Rhetoric, um, a treatise on argumentation by Kyle Perlman and Lucy Ulbricht Siddica. So, um, yeah, if you want, I can send you a PDF or something if you um, want to DM me. <clears throat> but they say something like the, the selection of data is always partial. You can never select all of the data. There's no such thing that, that would be possible. And in doing that, we're already kind of making argumentative choices like that. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but what does the data mean? One thing I'll say with my with my classes we'll do some things we do some assignments based around this where you kind of take a a fact a statistic and you try to kind of reinterpret it the the truth value might remain the same we might, we might still kind of see it that way but what it's evidence of or what it would lead us to think would maybe change in light of a new context so we practice doing this but there's some kind of simple ways of doing this where you'd say um you know uh this many people died of covid is that a lot or a little? And that kind of judgment about that, of like what the data means, isn't something that, that itself is going to be totally based. It's not something you can kind of deduce from the empirical evidence. The empirical evidence, the facts, might help you make arguments more or less persuasive. Because you would say, well, look at previous pandemics. We, if it, it should be similar. And we could, we could have saved more lives. Or look at all that was done, all the effects. How much more could we be reduced? This is really kind of necessary. Based on how you argue, you're going to give different interpretations of what that data shows us. But a lot of times people kind of go like, well, that's what the facts say. And they act as if they're not doing any interpretation. But really what they're doing is just very superficial interpretation. And this maybe leads to part of the problem that they're trying to address, which is this kind of scientism. Uh, an idea that I'm not responsible for discourse if I say things that are true. I don't have to do anything else. Um, okay. The audience is visualized by one undertaking to argue. Is always a... Oh, we already did this. Sorry. I forgot where I was. Essay making. Right. In real argumentation, care must be taken to form a concept of the anticipated audience as close as possible to reality. And in that... Oh, we did this too. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Concern with audience transform. We did this. The study of audiences could also be a study for sociology, since a man's opinions depend not so much on his own character as on his social environment, on the people he associates with and lives among. And this is what people in my field now do a lot of who are people that are data analysts. And they do kind of network analyses. And they'll kind of look at things that are people being saying on Twitter and say, well, can we predict what people will say based on just what networks they're in? Things like that. And that's fine. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and some, sometimes can be very interesting and important to think about. I like this little Mark Twain essay that he wrote called Corn Pone Pinions, Opinions. And he talks about this uh, little boy that he knew growing up who would give kind of lectures to nobody or to anybody. 
And he said, tell me where you get your corn pone. I'll tell you where you get your pinions. That, you know, your general shop in these kind of, this kind of Mississippi town or whatever, wherever they were. Wherever you shop, you, that's where you're going to talk with other people. And whatever the opinions are of the people that shop at that store, that's gonna, those are going to be your opinions, right? Which is a little disturbing to think of. We'd like to think that our opinions are all kind of ours. They don't kind of have a, an origin outside of us. But that really can't be the case. I mean, it, that doesn't really hold up to analysis very long, does it? Like, you kind of have to go somewhere to um, get your opinions. Forming your own opinion, I think it's good to kind of think about what would that look like. What would be required for that? And probably it would require a whole lot of work and education. But we also have the problem where education today doesn't doesn't see it even as something that's easy. It sees it as something that's bad. That that opinion shouldn't be part of your education. Forming your opinions is not something that education is interested in. The that a lot of the kind of reaction towards educators today, especially primary school educators or secondary school educators, is the people will be like, well, they're bringing in their agenda. They're bringing in their opinions, as if as if just having opinions is and, and kind of stating opinions or something, something like that is already kind of insidious act. If the facts are with us, who can be against us? Right, right, yeah. Well, I mean, these are the kinds of attitudes that they're they're trying to work against. If you want an uncultivated man to change his view, transplant him. Every social circle or milieu is d distinguishable in terms of its dominant opinions, and unquestioned beliefs of the premises that it takes for granted without hesitation. These views form an integral part of its culture, and an orator wishing to persuade a particular audience must of necessity adapt himself to it. Now, I do take a little bit of... Um, I do take some issue with this. And it's partly around this word adapt. Because it's, it's a kind of an ambiguous word. What does this really mean? What does it mean to adapt yourself to your audience? And um, in this famous debate between James Baldwin and William F. Buckley, there's this moment at the very beginning of James Baldwin's speech. They're debating about whether the American dream comes at the expense of the American Negro. When there's like two students debate before them. And when he gets up to speak, he kind of begins by saying, I find myself in the position of a Jeremiah. And I think this shows one of the possibilities of that kind of adaptation that's a little bit different from what we might imagine. It's an adaptation that sets you against those things, but aware in a, in a way where you kind of see yourself that way. Well, why Jeremiah? Because Jeremiah is the biblical prophet that kind of rails against the Israelites, tells them everything that they're doing is wrong, that they need to repent and change their ways. Jeremiah is not adapting himself to the opinions of people as they are. He's speaking to them and arguing to them because they value the same things in a certain way. And James Baldwin, in speaking into a culture that values that story of the Bible, or that kind of attitude, uses that as a way of saying things that are unpleasant. Adapting yourself to your audience doesn't mean kind of sharing those opinions. It means being aware of where the, how those opinions are situated for your audience, and taking due care and due diligence, if you're really concerned with persuading them, in treating those with seriousness and not kind of assuming, not kind of just kind of glibly throwing those off, being like, well, that's ridiculous. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, I guess, is what I want to say there. Thus, the particular culture of a given audience shows so strongly through the speeches addressed to it that we feel we can rely on them to a considerable extent for our knowledge of the character of past civilizations. Yeah, read Thucydides, you know, you'll get a vibe. Among the sociological considerations of possible use to an orator are those bearing on a very definite matter, the social functions exercised by his listeners. It is quite common for members of an audience to adopt attitudes connected with the role they play in certain social situations. This fact has been stressed by the originator of psychology of form, which turns out to be Wertheimer, uh, productive thinking. Okay, great. Psychology of form, I think, is, is gestalt -like psychology, I would assume, but I'm not sure. One can sometimes observe marvelous changes in individuals. As when some passionately biased person becomes a member of a jury or arbitrator or judge, and when his actions then show the delight, fine transition from bias to an honest effort to deal with the problems at issue in a just and objective fashion. The same observation can be made of the mentality of a politician whose point of view changes when, after years spent in the opposition, he becomes a responsible member of the government. I don't have no idea what they're talking about. I've never experienced this. 
<laughs> what are you talking about? I'm American. <laughs> this doesn't happen. Anyway, the listener then in his new functions assumes a new personality which the orator cannot afford to disregard. And what is true of the individual listener holds equally true of whole audiences. You know, actually, I, I can give one example of this that is kind of very American. It may, may be interesting, but I one time early on in undergrad, I was um, having feelings about all sorts of things. So I went to the New York Cafe where there was a poetry slam. And I didn't, I'd heard of poetry slams, but I did not know what they were. And I, I found that they weren't really my thing, but, you know, it was a good experience. And there were two things about that experience that maybe relate to this. The first one was the, the show opens by a guy kind of getting to the mic and doing a poem that's kind of a, a test poem. But he's a guy that it's okay. We can, he can test his stuff out. He's kind of established. So he, he becomes the measurement. Because the MC will appoint random members of the audience to be judges. So, you know, these were three women who were just kind of there to have drinks with their friends. And now they're judges. And you could, one woman was kind of quite vocal about being uncomfortable with this. She's like, oh, I'm not so sure, like, um, I like it, but what other people like. She's kind of doing this out loud. And the, and the MC was kind of trying to coach her. And, and this is all in a very relaxed environment. Uh, and, and kind of making fun of her, but joking with her, being like, just say what you want, baby. You know, like, what do you think? And she, but she felt some kind of tension between maybe what she felt herself and representing that as her judgment on the poem that the guy gave. And then another guy that was there in line with, who was a professional slam poet, was like, look, I really only ever have four poems ready to go. And I look around at the audience, and I have, I, I wish I could remember what all of the genres were, but the one that he ended up going with that night, he's like, this is a monster poem. He's like, see, see, <laughs> he was doing the very crass kind of sociological read of the audience. He's like, see, there's a lot of women here tonight. And um, I think, that, like, I want them to be sympathetic to me. So I'm going to tell a monster poem, which is a poem about me being kind of attacked by somebody in my life, and that I survived it. I survived the monster. And he did this, and he was, like, extremely successful. The judges loved his poem. They were like, oh, that's amazing. He's like, see? <laughs> so, you know, that's it can go like that. Anyway, digressions. The listener then in his new functions, his guy, that guy's name was Omni, and I think he had that tattooed on his knuckles. He was a funny guy. He was a funny guy. Um, the listener then in his new functions assumes a new personality which the orator cannot afford to disregard. And what is true of the individual listener holds equally true of whole audiences, so much so that the theoreticians of rhetoric have found it possible to classify oratory on the basis of the role performed by the audience addressed. The writers of antiquity recognized three types of oratory, the deliberative, the forensic, and the epidictic. Epideictic. I, I prefer to say epideictic, but they write it this way. Which in their view corresponded respectively to an audience engaged in deliberating, an audience engaged in judging, and an audience that is merely enjoying the unfolding of the orator's argument without having to reach a conclusion on the matter in question. I might take a little bit. I mean, I don't know if that, that's totally true, but whatever. Close enough for jazz. We are presented here with the distinction of a purely practical order whose defects and inadequacies are apparent. Particularly unsatisfactory is its characterization of the epideictic type of oratory, of which we will have more to say later. It's going to be one of the sections. Though this classification cannot be accepted as such for the study of argumentation, it is nevertheless the merit of underlining the importance which a speaker must give to the function of his audience. So it's interesting here that even though they're kind of pretty happy with rhetoric, they're calling their book the new rhetoric, they're very amenable towards it, they're looking at classical rhetoric here and, and re, like a very basic idea in classical rhetoric that there, there were Melanchthon later on would introduce an idea of a fourth genre, a kind of didactic genre of speaking. There was something in the Middle Ages called the Ars Dictaminis, which had this kind of specific genre of letter writing, a formal kind of bureaucratic letter writing. There were people, there, sometimes people talk about poetry as its own genre, things like that. There are certain variations on it, but pretty much all the time, there's these these categories. They were assumed as conceptually basic. So they're rejecting that. They're saying, well, you know, this we actually can't really study argument through this lens. This is not going to work. But it's good to remember practically because it shows a kind of awareness in classical rhetoric and traditional rhetoric of that, that discourses are based on audiences, even though they, they haven't kind of gone sufficiently to understand their audience. So they're not accepting this as... Uh, their own analytical terms, but there's some practical value to, 
to, to that. It often happens that an orator must persuade a composite audience, embracing people differing in character, loyalties, and functions. To win over the different seg elements in his audience, the orator will have to use a multiplicity of arguments. A great orator is one who possesses the art of taking into consideration in his argumentation the composite nature of his audience. And if you're in my class and you're watching this and you're going to read the Ellison too, think of the relationship here at this moment. A great orator is one who possesses the art of taking into consideration in his argumentation the composite nature of his audience. You could say that Ellison's whole essay, The Little Man at Chihaw Station, is a, a kind of particular response to how one might do that, even though he's thinking about it being a writer, not an orator, really. Examples of this art may be found on close reading of speeches made before parliamentary assemblies, a type of composite audience whose constituent elements are readily discernible. So one, I don't really show a lot of parliamentary speeches. One that I do occasionally show, or used to, was Mary Black's uh, maiden speech, as they call it, in the UK. Mary Black was an MP, or is an MP, for the Scottish National Party. And um, I believe that she's the, maybe the youngest person ever elected to uh, the House of Commons. And one of the things that she does that's kind of interesting in her speech from a rhetorical point of view to kind of analyze is she talks to multiple audiences there. She addresses the opposition. She addresses the government. She addresses um, labor, the Labor Party. She addresses the members of her own party, the Scottish National Party. She talks about all these. She's like, well, why? She, like, one of the things that she says is, I didn't leave labor which is kind of the, the major party there for um, people of her political persuasion. She's like, I didn't leave labor. Labor left me. And so she's kind of making an argument. A lot of people in the labor party were angry at the Scottish National Party for breaking the vote, so to speak, taking away labor power by creating their own party. And she's like, well, no, because you left me. I didn't leave you. So that's how she's right. It's a pretty interesting speech to look at. <laughs> Um, though many of my students have had difficulty understanding her Scottish accent, so I've also kind of stopped showing that because, uh, you know, that's important that you know what she's saying. But I don't think it's that hard to understand myself. Examples of this art may be found on close reading of speeches. Yeah, we just read that. However, an orator does not have to be confronted with several organized factions to think of the composite nature of his audience. He is justified in visualizing each one of his listeners as simultaneously belonging to a number of disparate groups. Even when an orator stands before only a few auditors, or indeed before a single auditor, it is possible that he will not be quite sure what arguments will appear most convincing to his audience. I would say it's not only possible, but it's um, almost certainly the case. You really will never really know until, uh, I mean, maybe ever, but um, you, you won't ever really know. In such a case, he will, by a kind of fiction, insert his audience into a series of different audiences. In Tristram Shandy, since argumentation is one of the main themes of this book, we shall often refer to it. I like how here they're like, okay, we know, we, we know we're going to talk about this book a lot. Um, we're just letting you know here. We're getting you ready for this. So if you haven't read Tristram and Shandy, <laughs> which is a great novel, um, go read that first, uh, which is kind of an odd thing to say. Again, and if this were a logical textbook, imagine them being like, before you kind of dive into first order predicate logic, or into some kind of programming language. What you should do is read this 18th century novel because we're going to be talking about it a lot. <laughs> uh, but the kind of the the conceit of Tristram Shandy is he's talking about his life, but he 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 can he's like n can never even get to the point where he's born. There's so much context that he has to give. He can never quite get there. So it's this it's a very kind of brilliant comic novel. So Tristram describes an argument between his parents in which his father wants to persuade his mother to have a midwife. He placed his arguments in all lights, argued the matter with her like a Christian, like a heathen, like a husband, like a father, like a patriot, like a man. My mother answered everything only like a woman, which was a little hard upon her, for as she could not assume and fight it, out behind such a variety of characters, t'was no fair match, with t'was seven to one. So all these different roles that his father takes kind of outclass his mother's arguments. But there's more than a bit of irony here, because is it really possible to argue like all of these things persuasively? isn't kind of arguing like a Christian and like a heathen. I mean, we don't, we wouldn't use that term anymore, but uh, do, they, do these performances undercut each other? It's hard to say. Notice that it is not only the orator who so changes his mask. It is even more so his audience, his poor wife in this case, which his tra fancy transforms as he seeks its most vulnerable points. 
However, as it is the speaker who takes the initiative in this breaking down of the audience, it is to him that the terms like a Christian and like a heathen and so on are applied. So this is a, I mean, this is a brilliant paragraph, really, of rhetorical theory that um, other people have written many, many, many pages about, and they kind of do in a, in a paragraph or two. And I think what they're trying to get us to see here is there is, um, when we think about kind of adopting a persona to speak from, what really is, what really that persona is, is a mask we're making for the audience. Say, try this on. But we have the convention, just like when we see something that kind of maybe moves us, like the movie, like a movie, let's say, that movie was really exciting. Well, we're the ones excited, but we apply that to the movie. And there's even a rhetorical term for this, hypology, where you kind of put a, a predicate on another thing that is really the cause of that thing or is related to that thing in a different way than it would usually be. Be like, the hills are happy, which really means that I'm happy, you know, looking at the hills or something. But I can say that the hills are happy in a way that, you know, maybe you get the gist of it. It has a little bit. Maybe, we're really, maybe most of languages like that. Where, we, where we're putting that predicate maybe isn't, there maybe isn't kind of a stable, natural place to put it. But when we put it on the speaker and we say, well, the speaker is acting like this, in some sense, the speech is making the audience like that, too. That's another way to think about it. When a speaker stands before his audience, he can try to locate it in its social setting. He may ask himself if all the members fall within a single social group, or if he must spread his listeners over a number of different, perhaps even opposed groups. If division is necessary, several ways of proceeding are always possible. He may divide his audience ideally in terms of the social groups, political, occupational, religious. So here today I'm going to speak to the, the senior members of our team and also to the neophytes or whatever it would be. You can kind of do this explicitly. These ideal divisions are not mutually independent. They can, however, lead to the formation of very different partial audiences. The breaking down of a gathering into subgroups will also depend on the speaker's own position. If he holds extremist views on a question, there's nothing to restrain him from considering all his interlocutors as forming a single audience, right? Be like, well, you know, you all have your different political identities, but you're all capitalists. I here represent the proletariat struggle or something like that, or... You know, you all have your different political differences, but um, I stand for the the right of the people, reclaiming their their national pride. And this parliamentary bickering is is a symptom of the problem. So there might be a re in conflating the audience into one group might be a, a kind of argumentative strategy even for some people. Well, this is all just it's all all these differences are all of a piece. They're all kind of the same thing. I might, I may, I may do this on occasion myself. Even knowledge of an audience cannot be conceived independently of the knowledge of how to influence it. The problem of the nature of an audience is indeed intimately connected with that of its conditioning. The term, this term implies at first sight factors extrinsic to the audience, and all study of this conditioning assumes that this conditioning is considered as applying to an entity, which would be the audience itself. Okay, what is he talking about here? Or what are they talking about? Ah, okay. I'm not free. I'm not free from the tree pollen. Alas, it's getting to me. Ah, anyway, it's bound to happen. I need to start taking antihistamines. So, what, are the, what do we mean here, though? By, let's, let's slow down a little bit. Because this isn't slow enough. We're only an hour and a half into the stream. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Let's think about this, this sentence. Knowledge of an audience cannot be conceived independently of the knowledge of how to influence it. When most people say, know your audience, they'll say things, they'll think of things like, know what your audience believes. But the rhetorical point of view is much more like, and, and Aristotle's definition of rhetoric is, the ability or the power to perceive in any situation the available means of persuasion is one way it's translated. And so if we're thinking about that as a, as a way of relating to audience, it's saying knowing my audience is knowing how they might be persuaded, how they might be moved. I'm not interested in where they, I'm not interested at least as in itself where they kind of stand right now. I'm interested in the kind of possibility of movement. I'm going to speak towards the movement that I desire or that I desire for them rather than for a kind of mechanical view, which is I'm going to take the belief, the static belief that there is and move it to some other static position. This is a bad way to think about it, not only because 
it is often manipulative or in a bad sense. It's also just ineffective. People's beliefs really aren't static. They're kind of always open. And, and uh, in a cynical way, public opinion polls show this all the time where people will be like, um, do you support a no-fly zone in Ukraine? High levels of public support in, in America. And then you ask the question differently. You're like, do you support the United States shooting down or NATO shooting down planes of Russians that enter Ukrainian airspace? Very, very low approval rating. Okay, so what do we make of this? Well, that opinion changes in language. It changes based on image and, and reference and presence and examples. That, that opinion and belief isn't a kind of static entity that we can rely upon. It's always moving. It's always moving, even as we have it and hold it. Even as we hold it dearly, even. The problem of the nature of an audience is indeed intimately connected with that of its conditioning. This term implies, at first sight, factors extrinsic to the audience. And all study of this conditioning assumes that this conditioning is applied, is considered as applying to an entity which would be the audience itself. Blah, 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 blah. We already read this. Okay, so what does he mean by conditioning? Various conditioning agents are available to increase one's influence on an audience. Music, lighting, crowd effects, <laughs> scenery, right? Uh, mise-en-scene of the speech. Be like, let me put, let's yeah, be in the right mood for this and various devices of stage management. So they're here even kind of getting into theater a little bit, you could say. These means have always been known to ha and have been used in the past by primitive peoples. Okay, this is an older text. It's a translation. They just mean people from earlier times. As well as by the Greeks, Romans, and men of the Middle Ages. In our own day, technical improvements have fostered the development of these conditioners to the point that they are regarded by some as essential element in acting on minds. And I would be one of those people, I think. I don't really think that it's useful to try to say uh, Aristotle calls some of these things. He's not really thinking of these, really. Uh, but you could say these are part of what Aristotle would call inartistic proofs or inartistic means of argumentation. And he's mostly thinking about kind of documentation or witness statements or things like that. Things that are outside of what you yourself are arguing, but bring into your argument, you kind of allude to it. But these other things of kind of like what's kind of the vibe or the, the mood... The, uh, what's the scenery here? Can we affect that? I don't know if I, it's, it's actually helpful to think of all that as outside of argumentation. I think it's more helpful to think about um, what kind of, what aspect of argumentation this relates to. But, um, okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I, I do want to keep reading this text and not just think about my own stuff. Time is a flat circle. <laughs> yeah, that show is so weird that that came from. It's a really kind of weird um, version of the police procedural, I would say. The fact that it gets kind of mystical. What is that called? True detective, right? It gets kind of mystical, but it's also that it's like mostly about pedophilia. It's a very strange moment of our cultural production that that appeared and was very popular. Um, all right, I am gonna go on a digression. I like the playwright August Wilson who is uh, a famous playwright. And one of his plays, or, or more than one really, but one of his plays, I think it's The Piano Lesson, ends with this kind of mystical, like ghosts kind of come in. And one has to always ask in uh, a play or an idea, or even even in um, a piece of art, that when the, the metaphysical or the supernatural comes in, is it coming in as a deus ex machina? Because the play can't kind of resolve itself on, in, in the terms of the world as we understand it, of how it works. Or is it bringing it in order to say something even kind of more essential? And um, I'm not sure how I feel about True Detective. I wonder if, it, if the things that it wanted to say needed to rely on something kind of metaphysical or supernatural. But maybe it did. I don't know. I'm curious what you think. That really is a digression, though. Um, okay. Besides conditioning of this kind, which is beyond the scope of this work, so they're, they're saying, yeah, we're not going to be thinking about this stuff. But they do kind of, but anyway. There is conditioning by the speech itself, which results in the audience no longer being exactly the same at the end of the speech as it was at the beginning. This is a good way also practically thinking about designing or arranging a speech. Sometimes people will use the term structure for speech, and I don't like this too much, but, um, 
I, I, I just enjoyed the ride. Didn't think too much about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it, it is a show after all, right? Um, the audience no longer being exactly the same at the end of the speech as it was at the beginning is uh, a good way to think about how to arrange a speech. A lot of people um, in my classes, through no fault of their own, will do something. And, and sometimes it's even what in the instructors will tell you to do. They'll say, state your thesis at the beginning, give three reasons, and then state it again at the end. Restate your thesis. This is the five-paragraph essay form that's just kind of adopted into speech. But restating the thesis is um, kind of an odd thing to do. Shouldn't it have changed? Shouldn't, shouldn't we kind of have gone somewhere? I sometimes think about it like this, that if a speech is it's like a taxi ride, if you get in and you're like, okay, I'm in here, and you're like, go here, and the like, taxi cab's like, great, we've arrived, you can get out now. You would feel really odd. But that's how a lot of speeches feel. Like, we've, we've, we arrive and we end in the same place. It makes it feel, even if we have gone somewhere like we haven't, so you want to kind of show, the, the conclusion of the speech is to show the value of where we've gone. Not just restate the thing that we said at the beginning. That's weird. But that is kind of what people default to. I think people default to it because it's very easy to teach that form. It's very simple to teach that. And so therefore, that's what you teach. <laughs> I don't think there's any other really good reason of why that keeps appearing. But, um, or, and then that, that it's just kind of inertia, institutional inertia. And landing a piece is hard to do. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, it's if you think about it rhetorically from the point of view of an audience, it's like this is a moment where the, the imagination of the audience is the most intense. If you, you can also think about it as arranging an experience for an audience. Be like, what would people be feeling at this end moment? What, what, will, what, what will I have done here in the speech? And you have to have a lot of, of faith in the speech and in the audience for that conclusion to kind of work. But often it's kind of, I would say, something that is very commonly effective is repetition with a difference the moment where something kind of comes back that we recognize from the beginning but it's now looks different or we get a little bit more of it or develops in a different way and, and so therefore we see the reason why we needed the speech if we end and we begin with something that we already all agree on or believe in and know then why did we need a speech it kind of makes the speech pointless it undercuts it it's self-defeating I spent 50% of my time on the first 90% of writing and 50% on the last 10%. Yeah, I would agree with you, except I often don't finish things, so I don't spend a lot of time on the endings of things because I just don't do them. <laughs> I have trouble with that. Number five, the adaptation of the speaker to the audience. Okay, so here we go. I already kind of told you my reservations about the term adaptation, but here they'll do a little bit more. Uh, we'll go into it a little bit more. And, and while we're doing that, also welcome to the stream. I'm going to get another drink and then go like vigorously itch my nose and hopefully that will make me not have to do it every 10 seconds, but um, it's too late now. I didn't take an antihistamine. It's really summer now. One second, I'll be back. All right, well, probably going to still itch my nose, but I took one. Yeah, never too late. I did just take an antihistamine, but um, it's too late for this stream, but hopefully it will help me later tonight. <laughs> but you're just going to keep seeing me itch my nose. Oh, well. Vico wrote, and so here's another thing. is like, they're like, they don't introduce Vico like you would know who Vico is, but their audience probably would have. Vico is um, a f Italian thinker of the 18th century. If you come to the stream a lot, maybe you've heard me talk about him. But um, they he also wrote a bunch of stuff that is at least very re closely related to rhetoric, depending on how you read it, more or less closely related. So that's why they're talking about him. 
Vico wrote, The end sought by eloquence always depends on the speaker's audience, and he must govern his, spe govern his speech in accordance with their opinions. In argumentation, the, th the thing is not knowing what the speaker regards as true or important, but knowing the views of those he is addressing. To borrow Gracian's simile, another kind of early modern person, speech is like a feast at which the dishes are made to please the guests and not the cooks. If you, if you invited people over to a dinner party and you made them, let's say you, you have a very high spice tolerance and you just made really, really spicy curry. You're like, here you go. And everyone's like, ah, I can't eat this. You're like, well, you know, sucks to be you. <laughs> I don't think anyone would think that you're a very generous or gracious host, but a lot of people will speak this way. The great orator, the one with a hold on his listeners, seems animated by the very mind of his audience. This is not the case for the ardent enthusiast whose sole concern is with what he himself considers important. A speaker of this kind may have some effect on suggestible persons, but generally speaking, his speech will strike his audience as unreasonable. According to M. Pradeen, the enthusiast's speech, even if capable of some effect, does not yield a true sound. The emotional reality bursts through the masks of logic, for he says, passions and reasons are not commensurable. Now, I'm writing a lot about enthusiasts right now, and I think I know what they mean and what they're trying to say, but historically speaking, enthusiasm, enthusiastic speech, has affected lots of people. And one of the things that I've learned about why that is, is actually often what is labeled as enthusiastic speech is very closely tied to the, not just the opinions of its audiences, but a modality of feeling that is very attractive to its audience. And this might be one of the, the weaknesses of this text, is even as it's a major, major corrective to rationalism, philosophical rationalism, as the basis for theory of argumentation. It still is, a, it still kind of is a little bit hesitant to go all the way, I would say, and um, and identify reasoning and emotion. But um, I'm thinking of a, an interview that Peter O'Toole gave along with Orson Welles. It was on some BBC channel, Channel 4, many, many years ago. And they were just talking about Shakespeare. In fact, they were just talking about Hamlet. And one thing that Peter O'Toole says is that he says, I think of every play of Shakespeare as an essay on the passions. The passions being a slightly older term for something like emotion, but it does have a little bit of a different meaning. And... In talking about Hamlet, he says, yes, and, and, and Hamlet is an essay, something like this, an essay on reason, the most noble of the passions. And, I, I, you know, um, it's Peter O'Toole, famous actor, drunk about town, kind of wild man. So, so but, but someone, someone who maybe felt reason as a passion, I think. So, you know, not an engineer, um, but there might be some reason to think of reason as a noble passion, so to speak, or, or at least has pretenses to nobility or something like that. Uh, maybe noble is a little bit too much for us. But thinking of reason as a kind of, 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 a, of a highly kind of um, mm, sublimated passion, I think might be more helpful. But they're not quite willing to do that all the way here. Uh, at least it seems sometimes to me. But they're not. Anyway, the apparent explanation for this viewpoint is that man swayed by passion argues without taking sufficiently into account the audience he is addressing. Carried away by his enthusiasm, he imagines his audience to be susceptible to the same arguments that persuaded him. Thus, passion in causing the audience to be forgotten creates less an absence than a poor choice of reasons. Listen, absence than a poor choice of reasons. Yeah. Being like, Oh my gosh, you'll never believe it. And someone tells you something, you're like, uh, actually, I, I would believe it. They kind of have over-identified themselves with... with the, the audience will be just like them, you know? It's kind of a, a, a solipsistic, maybe even narcissistic way of looking at things. That's really the problem here. The image of the audience is not persuasive. Because they adopted the techniques of the clever orator, Plato repra reproached the leaders of the Athenian democracy with flattering the populace when they should have led them. But no orator, not even the religious orator, can afford to neglect this effort of adaptation to his audience. The making of a preacher, wrote Bossuet, who's a famous French orator, also of the early modern period. Noticing a theme? That's the, this is the classical era for France. Yeah? He would be a kind of classical orator. 
rests with the audience. In his struggle against the demagogues at Athens, Demosthenes calls on the people to improve themselves so as to improve the performance of the orators. Your orators never make you either bad men or good, but you make them whichever you choose. For it is not that you aim at what they wish for, but they aim at whatever they think you desire. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a dating situation between orators and the public. You therefore must start with a noble ambition, and all will be well. For then no orator will give you base counsel, or else you will gain nothing by it, having no one to take him at his word. This also reminds me of another argument from another ancient orator, though he didn't really orate the way Demosthenes did. He kind of hung out in the background and wrote stuff. Isocrates, who's mostly very dull <laughs> reading. Um, but there are a few pieces where he says some interesting things and some provocative things. And in one of them, he kind of imagines himself on trial like Socrates was. This is I, Socrates, not Socrates. And um, that, it's a really weird text. It's kind of like metafiction in the ancient world. It's very weird for lots of reasons. It's, it's I think, by far the most interesting piece that he wrote. Uh, there are a few other maybe some contentions. And um, one of the things that he argues in that piece, I think it's in that piece, is he says, you, a, a, a polity we might say, or a, a state produces what it praises. So if there's a kind of general praise for artists, people are going to want to be artists, and you're going to get artists, because a certain number of people are going to... So whatever is being praised, you're, that's what you're going to produce in your youth. If you're praising people who are uh, gr good at being greedy... You're going to get greedy people because really what people want is praise or at least uh, there's enough people that really want praise. They'll do whatever they think they have to in order to be praised. So if you want to correct your political situation, what you need to do is change what you praise, which is a weird, it's kind of weird theory and maybe it works in the ancient world better than for us, but maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I think there are a lot of people today that are kind of like, motivated by certain things that are praised r really because they are in music or something maybe seems like they won't necessarily produce them but they'll at least produce the desire to become the thing well i think the argument goes that praising something produces the desire for others to become it general praise for something produces the desire for some others to become it and that once you have that desire inevitably you, people are going to become that some people yeah it doesn't i mean sure not everyone will be will want to be that but the desire to produce pop stars will produce a, will produce pop stars and a lot of failed pop stars <laughs> so i mean you know we, we could kind of uh we, we could disagree with this theory and say it's too simplistic but it might be a nice way to think about what kind of responsibility we have in public discourse that we're kind of contributing almost statistically to a sense of general praise or or blame and that in the aggregate, that might actually have a social effect. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm naive. Okay. Um, Although orators in their relationship to the listeners have always been compared to cooks, and even to parasites, who almost always speak a language... And here, parasites might mean... Here again, I think the translation is not very good. Parasite in French can mean... Many things. There's a guy right, whose name is Michel Serre who wrote a whole book on parasites around the various meanings of that word in French, which can mean things like noise, like the parasite in a signal is the noise. Or it can mean a kind of classical role, which would be um, there would be a rich person and he would have his parasites, which would be people that would kind of entertain him. His posse, basically, kind of like entourage, his entourage, like that terrible show. And a parasite would be a member of an entourage who would kind of like do whatever to stay in the good graces of the rich person and basically you know, be able to not have to work because they would just kind of be in the entourage. So these are people who almost always speak a language contrary to their sentiments in order to be invited to fine meals. Uh, who's saying that? Yeah, okay. So this is kind of referring to this ancient book, Petronius, where uh, uh, by Petronius called the Satyricon, which is like the main character, or one of the main characters is kind of like trying to be a parasite, if I recall correctly. A remora. Yeah, so we're, we think of parasite in this biological sense, but the biological sense is actually a metaphor, in some sense, of the other meaning, which maybe comes prior to it. 
um, in the ancient world, they didn't really know about biological parasites, at least the way that we would know it. They did know about remora, though, which is interesting. So that would probably be closer to their image of like a biological parasite. It might not be overlooked that the orator is nearly always at liberty to give up persuading an audience when he cannot persuade it effectively, except by the use of methods that are repugnant to him. It should not be thought, where argument is concerned, that it is always honorable to succeed in persuasion, or even to have such an intention. The problem of harmonizing the scruples of the man of honor with submission to the audience receives special attention from Quintilian. To him, rhetoric as a scienta bene dicendi, a, a knowledge of speaking well, or not a science even, if you want to say that, implies that the accomplished orator not only is good at persuading, but also says what is good. If then one allows the existence of audiences of corrupt persons, whom one nonetheless does not want to give up convincing, and at the same time, if one looks at the matter from the standpoint of the moral quality of the speaker, one finds oneself led, in order to solve the difficulty, to make distinctions and dissociations that do not come as a matter of course. This sentence is terribly convoluted in English, and I don't think it is in the French, but this is just the translation being bad. Um, or, let, let me be more humble. This is the translation suffering from the problems of translation. Um, one thing that Quintilian also said, they mentioned Quintilian here, but Quintilian defended people lying. He defended the orator lying sometimes. Uh, Barbara Cassin, um, I think that was her, also kind of writes about Quintilian as having this very interesting view of morality, of lying, of saying sometimes the orator's ability to lie is kind of a test of the orator's moral character. That someone who's unable to lie actually is not as morally competent as someone who is. And, and in some weird way, also Plato argues this in one of his dialogues. He's like the person who knows how to tell the, who knows the truth is also the person who knows how to lie. But Quintilian means it in a different way than Plato does, I think. I'm sure he was aware of Plato's dialogue. Though. Uh, which one would that be? Hippias Minor, maybe? The coupling of obligation on the orator to adapt himself to his audience. Or Hippias Major. I forget which one. One of the hippiest ones. The coupless, uh, the coupling, uh, the coupless, the coupling of obligation on the orator to adapt himself to his audience, with limitation of the audience to an incompetent mob, incapable of understanding sustained reasoning or of maintaining attention if in the least distracted, has had two unfortunate results. It has discredited rhetoric, and has introduced into the theory of speech general rules which actually seem only to be valid in particular cases. So here they're kind of dealing with the problem of, okay, well, what about adapting yourself to people who are no good? What should we do with this? And they're saying, yeah, this has been bad for rhetoric's rep. The reputation has suffered. We do not see, for instance, why as a matter of principle, use of technical argumentation should lead away from rhetoric and dialectic. There's only one rule in this matter. Adaptation of the speech to the audience, whatever its nature. And now here again, I do think, I, I just don't love this formulation. I don't really disagree with it. Um, in, in the way that I would interpret it, but I do think that it's, um, I do think it might be a little bit misleading. Uh, it kind of doesn't make you think of the moment of Jeremiah. Like, is Jeremiah an ad adapting to his audience? I would say yes, he is. But, um, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they kind of focus on this moment in a way that might be misleading. If you want to be dead set against your audience. It doesn't mean that you can't speak to them. It means that you have to kind of adapt to those things and make them, make it possible for them to feel what you feel. But, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking about little, some different examples, so they go in a different direction. Arguments that in substance and form are appropriate to certain circumstances may appear ridiculous in others. If the same well, that I agree with. If the same event is described in a work that claims to be scientific and in a historical novel, the same method of proving its reality need not be adopted in the two cases. You know, you know what? Before I go on, let me let me kind of go back here and think about this in another way. We're in section five, but in, but section four was that the audience is a construction of the speaker. So think about it that way. Think about the peculiarity of that. The only rule is that you must adapt the speech to the audience. But also, as a speaker, you're constructing your audience. If you hold those two ideas together, I think you'll get to a better version of what they mean. But um, it is it does it is a little harder to think what that means. Okay, a reader who would have found Jules Romain's proof of the voluntary suspension of the action of the heart ridiculous, 
had they appeared in a medical journal, might consider them an interesting hypothesis when developed in a novel. Um, yeah, we might say, okay, someone who's going to talk about cold fusion and try to publish it in nature today, we might be like, oh, that's ridiculous. But in a sci-fi novel, it might be like, this person you know, really knows their stuff. They made cold fusion look plausible. You know, not a great example, but whatever. The procedures to be adopted in arguing are to some extent conditioned by the size of the audience, independently of considerations relating to the area of agreement taken as a basis for the argument, which vary from audience to audience. In discussing style as affected by the occasion of the speech, J. J. Marouzeau has drawn attention to a kind of deference and self-consciousness imposed by numbers. As intimacy decreases, qualms increase. Qualms about gaining the esteem of the listeners, about winning their applause, or at least their approbation as expressed in looks and attitudes. This, this is something that it stands out quite um, evidently to me as not being about actual persons. Because let's say I'm in a public speaking classroom and the class will like be we're having a great conversation, be talking to each other. They'll be kind of like even ambitious and courageous and willing to kind of make fun of themselves and even like poke fun at them. They'll be doing kind of all this risky stuff, communicating in a conversation with one another. And then it'll be speech day. And they'll be like dead nervous, so nervous, scared to speak in front of the same people. Because the audience has changed in moving from con conversation to the speech. The people haven't changed. Well, I mean, I guess they have, you know, in some sense. But the, there aren't new people there. There aren't different people. What do we make of that? Well, you know, this helps us understand that effect that's happening. Many other observations might pertinently be made on characteristics of audiences that influence a speaker's behavior and mode of argument. In our view, the value of our study depends on consideration being given to the many distinct aspects of particular audiences in as concrete a manner as possible. That's what they say they're doing, but I don't know if that's really what they end up doing. However, we wish to stress in the following four sections the characteristics of certain audiences selected for their unquestionable importance to all concerned with argumentation and, and particularly to philosophers. No, forget them. They're not good for you. Break up with them. Anyway, oh well. They're, they're, they're all dead now, so I can't speak to them that way. Um, I wonder, how far should I go? It's probably going to be two parts, no matter, no matter how much energy I have right now. I feel pretty energetic, but it's already two hours. How far should I go? I think I, I assigned up to um, section 12, maybe, or maybe 13. I think up to section 12. So this would be about the halfway point. So I might kind of call it here. But thanks for hanging out on this stream with me. And um, maybe I'll linger around for a little bit and say a few final things. But if you have other thoughts on this stream as you've been watching, let me know and we can talk a little bit about it. I'd say that um, one of the things that's kind of coming here is we can just quickly preview. We already looked at the table of contents at the beginning of the stream. But specifically what's coming up here is they're going to talk about different audiences, not by saying, oh, um, young, like kind of like Aristotle does, young people, old people, rich people, poor people, not that kind of thing. They're going to be thinking about it kind of almost structurally. So they first they make this distinction between persuading and convincing people. Um, but then there's a lot of stuff about audience. There's the universal audience. This is kind of one of probably the most famous concept or idea that comes out of this book is the universal audience. Uh, it's a really important one for what they have to say. And then argumentation before a single hearer. Well, does do things change? If arguments change based on audience, what if I'm talking to one person rather than many? I streamed today, so I'm actually pretty brain fried. Otherwise, I'd have been more. I have more random thoughts for you. Oh yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Thanks so much for coming. It's it's good to see you. We haven't we haven't uh, chatted in a while, so it's good to see from you. I hope your stream went well. You you're you're streaming like. Um. Your stream is very popular, much more popular than this one. So, very, very cool stuff. I should probably let some of my students might benefit from your stream because they're they're um, they're coders. A lot of them are this summer, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll have to let them know about your stream. They might find it useful. I don't know what you're working on recently, but so there's argumentation before a single hearer, self deliberating. So talking to one person, talking to myself, and then talking to wait, I missed one. Oh, and then the effects of argumentation. Okay, yeah. I thought there was one more, but maybe I forgot. Okay, there's some other stuff. 
so that's what we'll do next time. I'll, I'll look into that. But I think that this is very helpful, a uh, very helpful way of thinking about audience, just because it helps us see the problems of not thinking about audience, but also thinking about audience in a in too simplistic a way. Being, oh yeah, those people. Because there's nothing that really would guide that thought. If you were to say, well, speak to your audience, if you know them. Well, I'm speaking to strangers. I don't know them. Okay, well then, say something. But if we think about audience in the way that they're trying to get us to, to saying, well, what would be kind of in this discourse? I have a general sense of how people tend to think in this discourse. What are the things that might be persuasive here? It's this imagination that is what you have to know and kind of refine. And it's weird because it's it's never knowledge of something that can be fully pinned down because you can kind of know your way around in a discourse pretty well and then someone will kind of come up who you have never expected before who will have a kind of way of putting together opinions that is not the statistically probable one and um, as to become a really excellent speaker I think you somehow have to ex expect that there's always that person there and that's kind of the Ralph Ellison theory of of audience which i think is a nice complement to this piece i don't think it really is um the same i don't think it's the same argument here that we'll read next time about the universal argument audience but it's a helpful kind of complement to it it's a slightly different take by really imagining the universal audience through an individual that is composite but the way that they've composed themselves is is part of the, the discourse They've put together things in a way that's possible because of certain aspects of our social reality. And that you should always kind of speak to that, to the eccentric possibility, not to the average one. Um, it's kind of an ethic of, of communication. As even, more, even more than really, I think, the universal audiences. Universal audience is often interpreted as an ethic of argument. That's something you have to kind of imagine. Um, but really, I think it's more of a feature of certain discourses. Sounds maybe like a persona in design. Oh, that's an interesting concept. I'm sure there are lots of other discourses that have theories. I don't know too much about that, so maybe next time I'll ask you more about, about persona. Another concept of the, is the super addressee in the theory of Bakhtin. Um, in, in psychoanalysis, there's this concept of the big other. Um, so there's various discourses that kind of rediscover this position that you need to address that isn't really inhabited by any one specific person, but needs to be there for any specific person to kind of recognize your discourse as being legitimate or something like that. Um, it's a little bit abstract. It's, it's hard to make it not abstract. So I think Ralph Ellison does the best that I've read in making it feel concrete, even though it still is a bit abstract. But uh, yeah, anyway, um, this is my first stream with a new camera. Um, I'm thinking I might change the settings because I was playing around with them. Oh my gosh, my nose is really red. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, that's bad. I was playing around with them and uh, kind of trying some things out with the new camera, some of the settings a little bit differently. So maybe next time you'll see the stream. You won't be able to see my nose is red because maybe I'll stream in black and white um, rather than use my black light. I'll be black and white. And uh, it'll be a little bit different. But anyway, thanks for coming by again. You will find this also on the YouTube channel later, um, which is called Rhetoric Prof on YouTube. You can find lots of my videos there. And uh, please follow the channel if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And you'll get an alert when I go live next time. It'll probably be wrong like this stream was. It was the wrong stream information, but <laughs> uh, bear with me. If you're interested in this, thanks for coming by and, and follow, and we'll talk more in the next time. Oh, nice. All right, see you, Alan, later.